The following videos are among the first ever recorded for soccer, basketball, and hockey. It's commonplace to immediately contrast and compare what changed and what stayed the same, and football is no exception. On November 14, 1903, Thomas Edison's company filmed the first football footage ever that pitted the underdog Princeton over Yale. This is their story. On a November Saturday, Thomas Edison, or at least his team, went to Yale Field in New Haven, Connecticut to film perhaps the biggest football game of the year. Before I go into the underdog, which was Princeton, I want to clear up a few misconceptions. Some people online claim that a game between the University of Chicago and the University of Michigan is from 1903. It is not. It's from 1904. And this particular YouTube user gets the date right, although I've seen another user give the wrong year, so I thought I'd mention it. Also, there is footage of President Theodore Roosevelt walking to a football game. This took place in 1901. Although he was going to see some football, no gameplay footage is actually shown. And finally, there is one video that shows a copyright date of November 19th, 1903 for this Princeton Yell game. The match itself took place on the previous Saturday on November 14th. Okay, so on to what made this game so crucial for Princeton. In the prior year, the 1902 Yale Bulldogs went undefeated and arguably became the national champions, depending on who you asked. Back then, they didn't have a system like we do now to determine the top team. So if you go with what the 1903 edition of the World Almanac says, it was Yale, as they never lost a game, although they did have a 6-6 tie against Army. In 1933, the NCAA would retroactively declare both Yale and Michigan national co-champions. And why was 1902 significant? Because one of their last games of the season was against Princeton, a team who, entering that game, was also undefeated, and so the winner would most likely be declared champions by people who weren't fans of Michigan. So 1903 would be the rematch. This time, not only would Princeton continue to be the underdogs to Yale, but they would also have to play this game in enemy territory at Yale Field in New Haven. Before we do a partial reenactment of this game, let's take a modern football field and go back in time to adjust it to how it would have looked in 1903. First off, let's get rid of the numbers on the grass. Those don't exist yet, and neither do the hash marks. Let's do away with the end zones, as those won't be created until 1912. Why did I take off only 5 yards from each one? Because the field of play was only 110 yards long. Now, how do you score a touchdown if the end zone doesn't exist? It's simple. Depending on which way your team was going, you'd either run out of bounds past this line, or you run out of bounds over there. Although I won't be using these for this field, beginning in 1903, some fields did have horizontal lines. A new rule came into play that finally let a quarterback pass the line of scrimmage on his own. Prior to this, quarterback sneaks and runs were not allowed, and the only way he could run with the ball was if he first gave it to someone else, and then they gave it back to him. They decided to allow them to run of their own accord, but only if they were five yards to the left or to the right of the center, and those lines were there to help the officials enforce that rule. So, if you ever see a movie that depicts a football game that takes place before 1903, and it has those horizontal lines, then in the cinema you can call the movie a liar and walk out while people look at you funny. And you can see by the footage that Yellfield hadn't added in those lines yet, although they would as evidenced by this photo from 1908. So I'm leaving them out. Now, let's meet some of the players. For the Yale Bulldogs, some of the star players include fullback Leonard Mitchell and Charles Rafferty, tackle James Hogan, guard James Bloomer, 
quarterback Foster Rockwell, and halfback Harold Metcalf. Let's go on to the 1903 Princeton Tigers. Prior to this matchup with Yale, the Tigers had shut out every opponent they had played all year, although the same thing could have been almost said about the Tigers the previous year because, with the exception of one single game, the 1902 Tigers had nothing else but shutouts prior to their loss to Yale. This year, though, they had to feel different. Despite the odds, as their offense was scoring, was noticeably up to complement the defense. The star of this team was guard and kicker John DeWitt. Along with DeWitt are halfback Danny Kaffer and end Howard Hendry. So let's fire up the Edison Kinetic Scope projector and let's see what we can see. Well, it's important to note that because nothing in this game is annotated, you can't tell what section of the game the action is from, as nothing overt occurs such as a field goal being kicked or a player running in for a touchdown. Instead, I'm going to be explaining what I'm seeing and then we'll backtrack and use a newspaper account of the game to recreate the actual gameplay. The cameraman filming all of this was Alfred Abadi, who was credited as Alfred Camille in the notes. Anyway, remember the iconic Marilyn Monroe scene of a gust of hot air blowing up her skirt? That may have been inspired by the 1901 short What Happened in 23rd Street, New York City, where something similar happens to a woman. And who is the actor walking by her? Alfred Abadi. So the cameraman who recorded the first American football game ever also acted in a short film that likely inspired the famous Marilyn Monroe scene. History is weird. On to the actual film. According to the Library of Congress, the first group we see is Princeton. Next, Yell is shown. You can see one of the people stop to talk with a person behind the fence, possibly so they can wish them good luck. Next, we see the H-shaped goalposts. Remember, end zones don't exist at this point, so to score, you run out of bounds anywhere past the line the goalpost is on. Also note how short the uprights are. This is before the rules are changed to make the uprights taller in an effort to deal with higher kicks. And if you look closely, you can see some people waving flags around, and the flag waving intensifies as the team goes to the fence, backing up the statement from the Library of Congress that Yell went into the field second. Next, what you see appears to be a drop kick. For those who don't know, that's when you catch the ball almost as if you're going to punt, and instead you let it hit the ground, and then you kick it off the ground in between the goalposts to score. If you slow down the footage and read the rules, the ball must touch the ground first. And you can see Doug Flutie, the last NFL player to do this in a game, waited until it made contact with the ground before kicking. Back to the footage. I'm guessing this is Princeton, as even though the sweater slash jerseys Princeton had were a darker color, as shown in some of the auction photos I've seen, they're said to be introduced first, and they do look lighter relative to what the second group of players had. This is because they are wearing canvas jackets that cover the jerseys that are designed to give extra padding and protection to the chest. I'm saying sweater slash jersey because back then, this is what the in-game jerseys looked like. If you notice the version of Princeton from 1905, you see pads have been sewn on, and you can see that here too, although it doesn't show up quite as well due to the quality of the film. Having stripes on the jerseys would indicate Princeton, but once again, it's hard to make out. And if you look back into the stands, you can see what appears to be the scoreboard at the very back, as well as smaller signs sticking out that told people which section of the stands they were sitting in. At the 255 mark, you see a punt. Know how closely the officials get to the action. Of course, they get pretty close in today's game, but the scrum players got in were much more chaotic, so they decided to forego safety in an effort to see a close-up look at what was happening at the bottom of the pile. At the three minute mark, you see another punt. If you like kicking, this game will put you in ecstasy. Then you see another one of the many, many pileups. Remember, passing the ball wasn't legal until 1906, so we're dealing strictly with runs. And the basic formation back then on defense was typically seven men on the line. And the last scene is near the goal line. However, it looks like the defense was able to stop them from scoring, at least on that play. 
Let's try to recreate this game using the Sunday, November 15th issue of the Baltimore Sun. A touchdown was worth five points, and an extra point was worth just one, hence the name. A field goal was worth five points as well, equal to a touchdown, but there was an incentive to score a touchdown instead, as the extra point would, of course, give you a 6-5 to five lead over the team that just kicked. The value of the goal would be lowered the next year to four points, and finally to the present day three points in 1909. Let's fire up the radio and pretend we are listening to a broadcast of this game. Only there's one problem. This game is so old, this predates football games being on the radio. That wouldn't happen until 1912 with the University of Minnesota. So what I put in its place to simulate someone listening in on a game from far away? I could do a telephone and pretend that someone is relaying information of the game to us, but there's another problem. If you were out on the West Coast, that would literally be impossible in 1903 as there was no transcontinental telephone connections between the coasts. You couldn't even call Colorado from New York. Instead, the West had their own phone systems and there wouldn't be a phone call spanning the length of the country until January 25th of 1915. So the phone is out. That leaves us with a telegraph machine, which did have an East Coast to West Coast connection. That's right. This game is so old that literally would have been the only technology available to get information about a football game from Connecticut to California on the same day. This game even predates the airplane, or at least the first successful flight of an airplane, as the Wright brothers wouldn't do that until December 17th, 1903, five weeks after this match. And the game is 70 minutes long, and instead of being divided up into quarters, it's divvied up into two 35-minute halves. And there is no standard first and 10 yet. To get a first down, you only have to go five yards, and you get three downs, not four. So, let's start this game. Both teams are late arriving at the field. Yale is going to receive first, and at 2.14, we finally have the kickoff as the whip kicks the ball to Yale. Yale runs it back to their own 30-yard line. First down and five yards to go for Yale. Yale rushes two times and takes it to the 37-yard line. Yale punts and sends the ball 29 yards. Princeton receives the punt and takes it at their own 50-yard line. First and five, Princeton. Princeton carries the ball four times for 12 yards. Princeton is now at the Yale 48-yard line. Cooney takes the ball around Yale's left end for 17 yards. First and five, Princeton at the Yale 31-yard line. Yale's defense holds Princeton, and they fail to pick up five yards, and there's a turnover in downs. It's Yale's ball. Yale opts to punt and first down. It goes 40 yards, and it's muffed. Yale recovers on Princeton's four-yard line. There's a penalty on the play, and Yale will be backed up all the way to around midfield. Yale punts again. Princeton fails to score on their next drive, and Yale gets the ball back. Hogan, Yale's right tackle, rushes for 23 yards. First and five, Yale. The ball is given to Hogan again, and he picks up seven more and another first down. A short run takes it to Princeton's 14-yard line. Second down for Yale. The ball is given to Hogan again, and he pushes it all the way to Princeton's line. It's a touchdown, and the score is Yale five, Princeton nothing. Mitchell kicks the point after, and Yale is up six to nothing. For the next 15 minutes, there is no scoring as both teams take turns kicking. Then Yale gets the ball back, and a series of runs averaging 3-4 to four yards per carry, Yale takes it to the Princeton 17-yard line. And Yale fumbles, but they manage to recover, but it brings the ball all the way back to the Princeton 30. This will bring up a kick attempt by Yale, but DeWitt plunges through the line and blocks the kick and picks it up in the 38-yard line. No one's ahead of him. Finally, a teammate catches up with him to block, and DeWitt runs it in for the score. It's now Yell 6, Princeton 5. Better line kicks the point after, and the score is now tied at 6. Yell gets the ball back and drives all the way to Princeton 17, but time runs out, and the first half ends in a 6-6 tie. At about 3.40 in the afternoon, the halftime break ends, and both teams line up again for the remaining 35 minutes of the second half. 
After 15 minutes of play, both sides have kicked the ball away four times. Yale gets the ball at Princeton's 35-yard line. Mitchell carries for 20 yards and takes the ball to the 15. First and five, Yale at Princeton's 15. Hogan carries for five. First and five at the 10. Hogan carries two more times and Yale takes it to the seven. There's a fumble and Princeton recovers. First and five, Princeton. And DeWitt punts the ball away in first down to get the ball out of Princeton territory. Yale starts at Princeton's 34-yard line. Yale fails to pick up five yards and it turns it over and downs. DeWitt punts for Princeton. It goes 48 yards. Yale returns it to midfield. Yale tries a trick play and loses five yards. Mitchell is forced to punt again. The ball rolls over Princeton's five-yard line. Punt of 55 yards, one of the longest punts in the game. DeWitt is only able to go 35 yards, and Yale takes over at the Princeton 40. First and five, Yale at the Princeton 40. Yale gains seven more yards rushing. There's a Yale kick, and 15 more yards are picked up. It's unclear if this was a result of a punt where Princeton touched the ball before Yale recovered, or if this is a court to the 1903 rules that allowed Yale to advance the ball via kick. First and five, Yale at the Princeton 18. Three more rushes carry the ball to Princeton's 11-yard line. There is an offsides play, and Yale is going to be moved back 20 yards. It's now in the 31-yard line. Yale is attempting another goal. Mitchell kicks, but the field goal is blocked, and Princeton recovers at the 11. First and five, Princeton. The next few minutes lead to more punts on both sides. Yale with the ball now. They fake a kick, and DeWitt has it. He rushes 26 yards around Yale's left end. It's unclear if this was a fake punt or a fake field goal. DeWitt kicks the ball again, and there's a fumble, and Princeton recovers at the Yale 28-yard line. First and five, Princeton at Yale's 28. Princeton rushes to the 15-yard line. DeWitt attempts another field goal, but the kick is wide and misses. There's a kick out and Princeton player of line calls for a fair catch in Yale's 42-yard line. Back then, when a ball went out of bounds on the kick, the defending team could do a kick out, which is where instead of their offense simply getting the ball back and say the 20 or 25-yard line, they would instead kick the ball out into the field. On this play, however, Princeton is able to get possession of the ball, and that's the first down for Princeton instead of Yale. Time is running out, and Princeton is going to attempt a field goal. DeWitt kicks it from 42 yards, and it's good. Princeton takes the lead. The clock runs out. Final score, Princeton 11, Yale 6. And as another note, it was not uncommon to punt the ball before the last down, such as punting it in first down or second down. It was a completely different mindset back then, and I'm not saying I completely agree with the logic, but the thinking was, if they're backed up deep into their own territory, because of the number of scrums and the propensity to fumble more, it'd be much safer just to get the ball away. They would sacrifice a drive in the name of being conservative. That's the game. Princeton beats Yale, the defending champions, a team that Princeton hadn't beaten since 1899. Coming into this game, they were the underdogs and outside of New Jersey, there probably wasn't a whole lot of people that thought they could do it, but they did, and this led to them being national champions, along with Michigan, of course. To follow up on what happened to some of the players after the game, there's a few interesting side stories. Fullback Leonard Mitchell, who was known for his proficiency in punting, later went on to work for the Maxwell Motor Car Company, where he was appointed president of in 1917. The company would fall into trouble, though, and would eventually get merged into Chrysler. Guard James Bloomer would coach Yale from 1906 to 1911 and form a mining company before serving during World War I in the U.S. Army Central Corps Aviation Section. And the star of this game, guard and kicker John DeWitt. He participated in the disaster, which was the 1904 Summer Olympics. And if you haven't seen the John Boy video on that train wreck, check it out. Oh, and he would end up in the College Football Hall of Fame in 1954. Very good underdog story, and through the invention of film, helps to keep it from being forgotten. So if you like this channel, please like the video and subscribe. If you want, I'm not going to tell you what to do. See you next time.